Thank you very much. And as I said, I apologize for the change of the title. Actually, I thought there was so much gene editing stories going on at the meeting, and there's also only another session that probably, if you are here, you're not that interested. So I apologize. If you are interested in gene editing, I will not talk about that, but there will be people on my lab talking tomorrow. So on, on the other hand, I think I try to address this, this, this topic. So say, how can we actually design a proof vector uh, for uh, the gene therapy strategy we are developing. Of course, we talk about antiviral vector for which uh, there's extensive testing, at least in ex vivo gene therapy using hematopoietic stem cell and T cell. Uh, but there's also cha op opportunity for in vivo application of these platform. What we have learned from ex vivo gene therapy with uh, antiviral vector from clinical use of these uh, vectors, which is quite extensive at this point, is that they allow to have stable engineering of uh, hematopoietic uh, uh, lineages, entirely hematopoiesis if uh, stem cells are used, and that uh, the, despite uh, the semi-random genome-wide integration of this vector, there's also, uh, it has been shown that there is a little evidence of uh, substantial genotoxicity, in, uh, essentially uh, according to the pre prediction of improved safety system uh, uh, as compared to early generation vectors. So this is uh, sort of validation may also help us uh, thinking of a broader use. And also GMP manufacturing has been established for support with the clinical trial. So in terms of how can we actually see this platform fitting um, the, the direct in vivo delivery, in particular the possibility of uh, in vivo uh, liver directed gene therapy is going to be focused on my talk. Actually, we have been working on that for several years in the past. Um, we essentially designing a platform which use both uh, transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation to sharply target expression of a transgene to hepatocytes. Uh, and as shown in here, you, can, you have both uh, hepatocyte-specific promoter to drive uh, expression mostly in hepatocytes, and we also have a target sequence for a microRNA, which is uh, mostly express, uh, selectively expressed in hematopoietic cell, so that if there is any uh, Ill illegitimate expression of this vector, maybe to low level, in antigen-presenting cell, this RNA will be uh, uh, down-regulated and suppressed, preventing direct expression and so direct presentation of the antigen. This strategy has been crucial, uh, as we know from uh, more than 10 years now, to allow stable expression of the vector uh, transgene in hepatocytes. Uh, uh, it actually may induce uh, uh, antigen-specific Treg in, a, in, a, in after in vivo delivery, uh, and it, we mostly uh, use that uh, to correct hemophilia in a mouse model for the A and the B. And also more recently, we have moved this hemophilia gene therapy to uh, scale up in a, in a large animal model, including the dog. The new data that are not published that I will uh, show you are actually part of a collaboration that we have established with BioVerative to further develop this, this, uh, this uh, approach, and in which I will try to, to illustrate some, some way to, to really improve uh, still vector composition, if not design. And so the study we, we, um, we, are, we have been performing uh, started also in, in a younger dog. Um, one of the advantages of a, of a platform based on lenti would be, of course, the possibility that the vector being integrated can be administered to, to very young individuals and then maintain expression throughout the grow. And uh, uh, we have given uh, relatively uh, modest doses as compared to what we have been used in, in, in mice, of course, because of the substantial scale-up effort. The, the dog, of course, are are the colony at the UNC uh, of hemophilia um, B uh, dogs. Now we have seen uh, after bolus delivery of uh, this large amount of vector particle into the dog, a very mild uh, acute uh, inflammatory reaction. Essentially there was uh, some fever in, uh, in all the dogs, which was transient, and some uh, self-limiting increase in amino transferase, at least in one of the dogs. And uh, we, we actually cover the dog with anti inflammatory antihistamine. So there, there's some evidence of inflammatory reaction, relatively mild. And this actually allows instead to establish uh, stable expression. You have seen the four dogs here. You, this is probably the most important one. This is clotting activity in terms of uh, factor nine uh, driven activity. And you can see that after the, the injection, uh, three of the four dogs have stable relatively high level, ranging from uh, 6 uh, to actually 30 percent. Uh, this actually has been a failure probably related to injection uh, of, of, of storage of the vector. And the activity is actually strong, higher than the, the antigen because this is a hyperactive antigen that we are using. So this will be a very 
a very uh, relevant therapeutic level activity which is maintained uh, long term. And, and remember, again, this dog has been growing significantly during that time. Um, there's no evidence of immune response to the factor, and uh, there has been, uh, as, as I said, a relatively mild limiting uh, reaction. So what, what, what we see the next step toward the clinical development of, uh, of this uh, strategy, uh, the two issues I like really to hover here, one is can we actually further alleviate the, in this uh, in acute innate inflammatory reaction to vector administration. It's mild, of course, but once you jump from one species to the other, you never know whether this will be predicting. And, and the second is, uh, can we better actually predict the dose response when we are in humans, again, considering species-specific interaction, which are very relevant in vector, in vector biology. And again, HIV-derived vector may be actually better suited to humans uh, than from dogs. So one of the things we have to consider, uh, talking about antiviral vector, these are uh, envelope, membrane envelope viruses which bud from the producer cell from which they acquire essentially the, the, the whole outer envelope. And so most of the protein exposed on the surface of the, vi of the virus or the vector uh, beside the viral envelope will actually be coming from that cell. And in, that, in our case, it will be human cells, which could be an advantage. But at the same time, we also can say maybe we can actually modulate this surface uh, by modulating gene expression in the producer cell and essentially predicting what type of composition of that membrane will be, um, will be part of the virus. And one of the things we at first ask is, uh, granted that most of these are, are human protein, they will be potentially invariant when administered to humans, some of them are not. And in particular, we were, became concerned of uh, major histocompatibility complexes, which are, as you know, of course, highly polymorphic. And so potentially could represent alloantigen present on, on the membrane of the virus. So actually, this is an electron microscopy analysis showing that indeed uh, this is actually staining for the VSV envelope. So you see viral particle covered with the with expected viral envelope, but also there is a significant signal for uh, MHC1 complexes. And also by Western blot or purified vector particle, we can detect that. Now this is a potential alloantigen present on a viral surface, which we were concerned about. So we, uh, uh, using gene editing strategy, uh, we actually we, uh, um, uh, disrupted the beta-2 microglobulin gene in the producer cell, and this is an essential component to express MHC molecule on the cell surface. The cell become MHC uh, negative. These are the ones that we sorted and used to make vector, whether from stable producer or from uh, uh, transient transfection. The vector made in this case actually lack any staining. This is also a quantitative analysis done with the MHC-free vector, and this is also Western blot. Is this, has this an advantage uh, for the vector? Of course, it's not so easy to test. We, we would have to score this advantage in humans when we get there. Um, for, uh, when you put the vector in dogs, most of the other would be xenoantigen already. So uh, at least we did an ex vivo assay in which we took uh, uh, um, uh, blood from a healthy donor and we challenged essentially the vector with uh, monocyte derived macrophages. And then we uh, expose the, the cell, which had been uh, incubated with the vector, to lymphocyte from the same donor. Potentially, this should be uh, an autologous setting. There should be no activation. Uh, actually, we did see, we did see activation uh, uh, for a number of uh, sorry, this is uh, for a number of um, donor that we tested, uh, and, and this activation of those t autologous T cell was uh, significantly lower when we use uh, the MHC-free vector. So there's still some residual activation that we see here, but it looks like, uh, in principle, we are re potentially removing an alloantigen, which can be spotted. This could be uh, both uh, a sort of an indirect presentation, so the macrophages can take up the vector and then expose fragment or, or the entire membrane protein. And it could be a relevant issue, potentially, in activating immunity. So although we, we have no direct evidence of that in vivo, I think that we have an interesting evidence in vitro of a relatively easy maneuver to improve uh, the, the vector surface. And, and this vector works as the standard one at uh, um, uh, establishing factor nine expression in mice, as you can see here. So there's no actually loss of activity. But then we actually went further to say, can we actually more, more, more uh, enhance uh, this engineering and um, more sharply reduce uh, immunogenicity and potentially uh, also improve biodistribution of the vector? 
And, and this uh, uh, goal came from this observation. Um, this is a dose response of a vector dose to factor 9 output in mice. And this is not a linear dose response. Actually, it is a sort of flat for the low doses. And then when you reach a threshold, then you have actually a sharper increase. If we look at the vector copy number in different hepatocyte cell population, most of the vector is uptaken in liver and spleen after intravenous delivery, um, you, we can see that actually a very high vector copy number, up to 30 copy per genome, is found in Kupfer cell of the liver. And, uh, and these are also non-parenchymal cells, not non purified And here, I, actually, the, 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 the brown one would be the the hepatocyte. So the majority of vector copies is found in uh, the scavenger cell, which of course is expected. They don't, they filter and essentially clean the vac vector from the circulation. So to actually reach uh, uh, vector copies in the 0.1 to 1 range, we really have to saturate first essentially the, the, the non-parenchymal compartment. And then we start to see. So it's possible that this uh, flat dose response is actually due to this uh, uh, scavenger effect here. Now, macrophages don't just eat randomly. Uh, there are very s many signals which can modulate phagocytosis. And uh, in particular, uh, it is quite well described in humans uh, and, 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 and mammals in general, a system based on surface molecules which control phagocytosis. Uh, a major component of that system is uh, CD47, also called don't eat me uh, signal. <laughs> many uh, circulating cells express this molecule and which is uh, bound by a receptor of macrophages and in, in, in inhibit phagocytosis. And essentially, this is a mechanism to, to time the half-life of the circulating cell, so that red blood cell eventually will lose CD47 and start to be eaten up by macrophages. Circulating cells then do have, need to have a certain level of CD47, and uh, leukemic cells, for instance, they tend to overexpress CD47 to survive in circulation. So it seems to be a very highly regulated model. So CD47, is first expressed by most, if not all, human cells, but also is quite human-specific. So we may not be able really to model that so easily in mice. And first we ask, do, do, vector, do our vector comprise CD47 on the surface? These are the producer cells, which are uh, stained for CD47, so they obviously have it. And it, we also find some of that on the, on, on the cell surface, or, on the vector surface, as shown here. To model this as an impact, uh, we, we um, disrupted CD47 first to make also CD47 free vector. And now we compare um, the, the vector transduction on standard 293 T cell and on macrophages. And, and the vector tend to be more um, uptaken by macrophages as compared to 293 T cell, like the same doses. But this uptake is actually substantially lower in the, uh, um, sorry. This, this uptake is substantially higher if we remove CD47. So it looks like CD47 on the membrane is somehow protecting, to a certain extent, uh, vector uptake by macrophages. I'm saying somehow because maybe this is not uh, maybe enough. Maybe we can do more. Uh, as remember, this is a tightly regulated system. So we now overexpress CD47 on producer cell. We have vector particles which are much more uh, abundant in CD47 content, as also shown by quantification of the electron microscopy. And, and these vectors now are uh, quite substantially protected by the, the macrophage uh, uptake in vitro. And this is a human system, which really showed that, and this could have both advantages, both in potentially improving biodistribution to targets, intended target, but also decreasing innate activation, because of course these are the prime cells which could release cytokine upon exposure. Can we model this in mice? Now, as, as I told you, CD47 is quite species-specific. So we expect that our vector, when, into, when in, infused into hemophilia uh, B mice, as I showed before, would not use this system because the human CD47 does not cross-react with the standard C57 black 6 uh, C receptor. There is actually a, a strain of mice, which are uh, the NOD, uh, which have uh, a cross-reacting receptor for CD47 cross-reactive with the human CD47. And, and this is actually the reason why NOD and not skid mice are mostly used when you use human cell for transplant, because you need a, both an immunocompromised environment, but also a CD47 reactive environment. So our question was, is there a difference in the biodistribution of the vector between uh, the standard hemophilia B mice and the NOD mice, which uh, would be 
potentially responding to the CD47 on the vector surface. And, there is, and, and actually, the experiment was, was strikingly so. Uh, we have uh, in, in the NOD mice that there is a significantly longer half-life of the vector in the circulation, dramatically higher output of factor 9 after the same dose administered to the mice. And if you look at vector copy, you see there is a, a, a significant drop in the vector copies in the Kupfer cell and macrophages, in the spleen, in, in the liver, and an increase in the hepatocyte transduction. This difference, you could say, well, you are using two different mouse strains, so you, how can you really know that this is true dependent on the CD47 now being able to cross talk with its receptor? So we now use the CD47 less of free vector that we generated. And in this case, if we inject the CD47 free vector, there's no difference in, in the output in the, in between the NOD and, and, the, and, the, and the CD7 black mice, so indicating that uh, CD47 is really dictating a substantial part of the biodistribution. So the question was, can we actually now protect even more the vector from uh, phagocytosis using the CD47 overexpressing vector? And uh, again, you can see here that we can further decrease in the NOD, which is the permissive strain, we can further decrease macrophage uptake uh, by, by this, this particle. And interestingly, if you look at the uh, inflammatory reaction, which we can follow in the mice, in this case by looking at the spike of some cytokine, like IL-6 here, MCP1, MIP1-alpha, you see in black here, this is the cytokine response in the, in the C57 mice. And uh, on, on the right is the node. And you can see, uh, maybe, look, maybe look at IL-6, which is quite clear. So we see a spike of IL-6 after vector administration to the C57 mice. If you do the same dosing in NOD, this will be the line. So there there's much, much less in, uh, responses. Um, if we remove the CD47, so the vector without CD47 actually does the same spike as the as seen in the C57. If you do overexpress CD47, we lower that. So it looks like, again, that the, in this innate response can be modulated by the extent of phagocytosis, in the, in which we can see in the mice, which is quite interesting because we can really have both the benefit of improved biodistribution to target cell and uh, intended target cell and also um, um, less uh, inflammatory reaction. Uh, so this, the summary of this part is really that uh, there are in very relevant ways to control these acute uh, uh, responses, including uh, biodistribution uh, in vivo by modulating vector surface. So the key point was then, can we actually see whether this prediction actually holds up when you move to, the, to a more relevant model like a non-human primate? And uh, do in fact see a benefit of these changes substantial enough uh, to, 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 to really move it forward? And at the same time, we can probably interrogate a more relevant model in terms of the cross-reaction with human protein. So we move eventually to do a primate study, which you know is quite challenging, both in terms of the amount of vector to be produced, the cost of the studies, and also the quality of the vector. And in this study, essentially, we perform uh, in France, uh, Nantes, in, uh, we use a, a non-restrictive uh, uh, monkey uh, strain, which should allow good uh, uh, transduction by HIV-derived vector, and we compare essentially the standard vector with the CD47 high vector after a single IV administration. And first, in looking at the acute reaction, you can see here uh, there is a very limited, uh, luckily very limited reaction to the vector, maybe even somewhat less than what we saw in dogs. Uh, there was no fever, for instance. Uh, there is some uh, increase, uh, mostly, however, uh, within the range of the, of the uh, liver enzyme, AST, uh, and, and some increase in kalemia, which, however, was also seen for the vehicle. So this has to do more with the anesthesia. Um, the, 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 there was no fever induced by the administration. Uh, the only uh, reproducible finding in terms of acute response was a, a, a transient drop in white blood cell, mostly due to lymphocyte drops, maybe a grass from the vessel into the, into the liver, and, uh, and, um, and which is uh, possibly indicating an acute responses. In terms of the we, of course, the my, this dog express uh, factor 9, uh, sorry, the, the, the primate express factor 9, but the, where we use a human factor 9 transgene so we can monitor actually human specific transgene and activity. 
Uh, and that's actually the, the very good news we found in the study was that while the, the vehicle in in, in, in injected primate maintained the same clotting time, actually all the other vector injected mice did that clot faster, indicating potentially a very significant uh, in, uh, output of, uh, of the vector in the model. And indeed, when we, when we measure, these are still the preliminary data, the, the study is still ongoing, but a lot of data will be collected. You can see that these are the three the, uh, monkey injected with a standard vector, and they actually reach between 30 and 150 percent of uh, stable factor IX output, while the same doses of, of the CD47 high reach up to 300. The third the term monkey is actually is here, but we don't have the final, the, the, we have to reproduce the finding. So we reach up to 300 percent of, of factors. So there's two, day, two important findings here. One, first of all, overall, this is a very high output, indicating that somehow in, in the monkeys we have a more favorable, responsive environment to, to, the, to the transduction. And secondly, the CD47 seems to be extremely relevant as well, CD47 overexpression versus standard expression to further increase uh, uh, the output. And in terms of the acute responses, we also monitor uh, cytokine uh, release, uh, which we detected uh, um, in the monkey as well. It's the sa actually the same cytokine that we found in, 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 ma in mice, so there is some actually relevant for the early model. And, and again, you can see in blue are the, the standard vector injected mo uh, monkeys, and, and the other are the CD47 high. And you see, even this relative model spike was substantially reduced or abrogated by the CD47 overexpression. Uh, and that's also true in these cases. So in summary, we have seen um, very uh, good, I would say, uh, um, profile, acute, uh, toxicity profile of the vector intravenous administration in a non-human primate with a very mild inflammatory response, mostly seen by mild increase in liver enzyme and in, 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 some, in a panel of cytokine, uh, which however was uh, response which was lower to undetectable by the CD47 overexpression. And we found, and actually for one, a surprisingly gratifying improved those response. Normally when you move to, you know, to, a, to, a, to a mouse model, to a more challenging model, you would expect some time for some reason to find a worsening. And in this case, actually, we found an improved uh, dose response. So overall, this, this, this strategy tells you there's this way we can still improve. Of course, these are complex particles, but we have the benefit of potentially modulating the surface. And I, I think I show you two examples in which we can uh, improve the, the stealthness or self-looking, if you want, uh, uh, self-looking profile of, of vector, which, of course, is best, best demonstrated in the proper cognate setting, whether it's the non-human primates or human, human themselves. And, and we found this favorable translational profile uh, when we move uh, to uh, the cognate host. If we compare our um, essentially dosing studies, and if we look at what would be the, the dose per kilo of a of vector moving from mice to dogs, actually we found a slight improvement in the, dog in, in the, in the dose response, but when we move uh, from dogs uh, to, to the primate, actually we found a substantially reduced uh, 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 improved, improved dose response, uh, which was even and better. We actually don't know even what would be the actual dose for reaching 30 percent, because we have essentially overshooted now in the current study the response. <coughs> so that's indicating the, uh, the value of predicting model, but also the relevance of uh, uh, species-specific interaction. So in conclusion, I think this, this data would support the feasibility in, uh, of moving this platform forward uh, to, to eventual clinical testing. Uh, as we have seen uh, stable and substantially high level of clotting factor expression in large animal, but particularly in non-human primate, which are, to our knowledge is the first time a uh, bolus injection of Lenti was tested. And, and so this platform may in fact help addressing some of the outstanding challenges uh, of uh, liver directed gene therapy and complement, of course, the important results which are being seen in the clinic using other platforms like AAV but making potentially a uh, broader access to, to, to this uh, type of gene replacement therapy to patients who are not suitable to current strategy or eventually to young children who may benefit from a platform which allow treating a uh, young, young uh, individual. With that, I will have to acknowledge, of course, the people in my lab who did this work, in particular Alessio Cantore, who has been really leading this project uh, for several years in the lab, together with Michela Milani, she's a PhD student, Andrea Noni, who has been leading all the immunological surveillance and studies um, in, in the lab, and, and a team of technicians. And as I said, this has been a collaborative work funded by 
bioverative, in particular Rob Peters and Tonya Liu, and I acknowledge the uh, University of Carolina with Tim Nichols uh, and David uh, for the dog uh, for the dog studies, and Eduardo Ayuso and Philippe Mouillet in Nantes for the primate studies, and Molmet for uh, the production of the uh, high quality vector for injection. Thank you for your attention. Take question. Now this paper is open for discussion. So you have a question? That Cooper uh, cell is interesting. So if you use a Cooper cell uh, specific promoter, would that be enough to produce um, your factor 9 we think that if you use, if we have expression in Cooper cell, even just because we use like a, a, a constitutive promoter, we, we elicit a cellular immunity, which usually get, get to clearance of the transduced cell. So uh, it would be a strategy to immunize maybe, but not for a gene replacement. Uh, I guess it would be the same if you use a Cooper specific promoter altogether. Uh, I have. <laughs> yes. So we measure, of course, both part, physical particle by uh, an immunoassay uh, using the P24 antigen, and then we do titration assay on cell which are uh, human cell, and, uh, and that will give you both uh, the, the, the infectivity. The infectivity will be the ratio between physical and, and titer. So if, if the vector comes with similar infectivity, then you have the perfect experiment because you have the same amount of physical particle and, and, and same amount of uh, infectious particle, which is what we have seen in, in these two examples. And actually, on 293T cell, there's no sharp difference. So one of the, but that's a, it's a very good point because one of the challenge on doing this experiment is that, of course, different batches of vector may come with different level of total particle. So, so we have to adjust. This is not always the case. So we tend to adjust. Uh, we try to, uh, to, to, to select batches which are very corresponding parameters for these studies. For manufacturing side, um, this was it, it still well. That would be quite challenging. Uh, um, probably current uh, capacity of production. Uh, what we do in the clinical trial for the ex vivo uh, gene therapy would be one batch, one patient. Uh, but because now we can hopefully scale down even tenfold, that become much more manageable as a prediction. Hi, um, going back to your uh, system of uh, expressing uh, CD47, I was wondering if you have tried to use mouse CD47 instead of human one to be able to use it on other mouse models that don't cross-react for the human uh, CD47. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we are doing this. We are, we are, the experiments are, are ongoing. We have generated, uh, essentially, we have disrupted the, mouse, the human CD47 and uh, instead expressing the mouse CD47 in the producer cell, we are testing this in the mice. Uh, very preliminary data show a benefit. So actually we have more output of factor nine in the, even in the hemophilia B, which is the non-responsive now. So we make now the system more responsive. So it seems to fit, although this is preliminary, but it's, it's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I think I have two questions. Uh, the first is you modify the lentivirus like MHC, uh, MHC3 and the CD47. So do you see a uh, job in production yield compared with your regular lentivirus? In protection? Yeah, in production. Um, we think, as I said, we, we don't have a, a, a hard proof that the lack of MHC uh, protects in, in vivo because we don't have uh, um, direct uh, evidence of that in in vivo studies. But for instance, we have looked at uh, uh, sera from patients who are uh, polyimmunized, my patients are receiving transfusion, and these sera are, uh, tend to sometimes to neutralize the vector very effectively, and we found that this neutralization is directed to MHC allotype. So in those scenarios, we have clear evidence that, that we may protect the vector from a pre-existing immunity, which however is not probably common, it may be a disease-specific factor. We are concerned, however, that uh, a transduced cell may transiently express some of these alloantigen and may become potentially not targeted by a cellular response. So 
Uh, this is in part of this is based on the prediction of it. And because it's relatively easy to make a vector without MAC, it's just better to get rid of, in my view. Okay. Uh, my second question is um, when you see the higher than normal the factor nine expression, like a 300 percent, do you see any negative, uh, negative impact on the animal study? So this was not reported. This, of course, is a, is a, was a three months of observation, so there was no report of adverse effect. Okay. Uh, obviously, we don't want that, so for once we are pleased to see that, and we can scale down substantially the dosing. Thank you. Right. And our next speaker is going to be Mavis Sabanji McKenna, and she's going to be sharing with us her, as always, pioneering work in engineering AAVs to enhance performance. All right. Yeah. All right. So I'd like to start by thanking the, the Viral Gene Transfer Vectors Committee for inviting me to talk um, today. And they gave me this title, so it wasn't my choosing, but I'm going to, <laughs> I am going to um, try to tell you what we've been doing with AAV to, to, to enhance performance. So um, first is my disclosure slide. Um, I'm co-founder for a new company called Stride Bio, and then um, scientific uh, advisory member for Voyager Therapeutics, as well as AGTC. I consult for Intima Biosciences, and I have sponsored research agreement with these uh, entities. So um, my lab is really interested in using the structure of AAVs to guide us in understanding the, the properties of, of the virus. But um, I, I borrowed this, um, this timeline from a, a review from Terry Flott, which showed us uh, from the discovery of AAV in 1965 to the first clone in the first human use, the first structure of AAV2 from the Chapman group, and then um, to you know, all the subsequent uh, showing of the clinical efficacy of the virus um, until we got our first biological um, agent in Glybera, which took us 45 years. Um, but what I want to point out to you is that these viruses are really small, so these are contaminant of ads, so these tiny little dots um, are the adeno-associated virus. They belong to the parvoviruses and they depend on the parvoviridae family. They don't have an envelope. They're very small. Genome is only 4.7 kb, um, which is shown here. Very, very simple, a rep open reading frame, which codes for replication proteins involved in packaging and gene replication and a cap protein which assembles the capsid. Um, and, and in a, just 60 copies make this T equals one capsid, and then there's this assembly activating protein which if you were um, in the AAV uh, vector session on the first day you would have heard um, uh, about. So what's really interesting for us is that these, at least, well, we did also hear a talk about AAV being associated with HCC, but for all intents and purposes, we believe that it's non-pathogenic. It could obviously, it could package and express foreign genes, uh, could transduce both divided and non-dividing cells, and could show long-term gene expression. So we're very, you know, so we want to use it. Um, I, I really like this uh, data from Guangping Gao, which again, if you went to the uh, education session yesterday, you would have heard a wonderful talk from him just telling us about AAV. It really expanded our, um, how many AAVs we had to work with when they published this paper in 2004, where they, they reported over 150 different genotypes of AAV isolated, uh, grouped into this distinct different clades. I don't believe they're really antigenically different because we've shown now that they are cross-reactive, and then these two clonal isolates. So, um, so this really gave us a playground to work with. Uh, what we know is that they really have high sequence identity from about 57 to um, 90 here, but if you compare, say, AAV1 and AAV6, they only differ by six amino acids, so really, really similar, and yet have distinct properties. Um, what is really cool is that many, many, mem uh, these different representative members 
as well as some of the rhesus isolates are being used uh, for gene delivery. Uh, and people using them for you know, whatever um, uh, they want to transduce. So certain serotypes and muscles, certain ones for liver, and then others for the brain or the heart or the lung. So you pick your vector based on whatever you want to target. This, um, these capsids are also the target of the immune response which we have to deal with for these vectors. So um, this is an old slide and the reason it's old is because every time I go to clinicaltrials.gov, the number of clinical trials has changed. So I'm stuck in, in summer 2016 where there was about 119 clinical trials ongoing and 66 of them were in the USA. So a lot of clinical trials then and this number is, has really gone up. I think Guang Feng mentioned that it was over maybe 200 trials ongoing. So, so this is really great and the vectors work in, but there are challenges that we still need to face. And so these are the, some of the challenges that we've decided to try and tackle, at least using structured biology. So we have to think about targeting specificity. The vectors <coughs> get targeted to the liver, if you want to deliver to the liver, that's great. If you want to go somewhere else, that's not so great. And then you have to think about uh, transduction efficiency. This is really normally related to trafficking. There's a lot of clearance of the vector before you can get to transgene expression. So we need to try and minimize that. There's also packaging. You've heard, uh, say it's 4.7 kb, maybe you can get to 5 kb. So we need to be able to increase this packaging capacity and most importantly, this prevalence of uh, anti-AAV antibodies, which obviously will prevent gene expression. So, so these are some of the challenges that we want to face by improving the system. So to be able to do that, I felt that we needed to understand what's going on when the virus, either wild type or a, a recombinant, um, is going to um, enter and express a gene. So we have to think about the virus entering the cell. So that's my step one. We have to think about the virus trafficking through the end of a lysosomal pathway, and this is step four to five. And there is a special enzyme encoded within the virus, CP1U, that is needed for escaping from this endosomal pathway. And that's externalized after pH. Um, and so then the virus has to go into the nucleus, um, encode, replicate, um, um, you get transcription, and then translation happens outside in the cytoplasm virus has to come back into the nucleus because the DNA virus has to package here, assemble, package, and then come out again. And then we have to deal with antibodies up here. Also noted is the virus gets targeted to the proteasome. This is the work by Arun Sripasava's group. So we figured that we can try and understand all these different steps and that will help us with improving the, the system. So that's what we set out to do. So we set up some goals. We decided that because these vectors have these different tropisms, we would try to understand their structure. We would first understand AV1 to 9, and then we'll expand it into some of the R8 vectors, as well as the non-vertebrate vectors, such as the serpine virus um, and the virus, the bearded dragon. I mean, who wouldn't want to work on the bearded dragon virus, right? So, and then we wanted to annotate those with respect to how does the virus um, recognize the cell, what happens during trafficking, how does it package its genome, and what are those antigenic um, uh, regions on the capsid. So we figured that if we could understand all of these determinants, we could try and modify the capsid for improved efficacy. I'm not going to have time to really tell you what we've done about packaging today, but I'm also just going to summarize most of the work we've done. So what does the capsid look like? That was the first thing we tried to understand. And so this is the capsid, or at least the capsid protein. is very simple. It has a core region right here, which it is uh, made up of these strands and this helix, highly, highly conserved. And then it has the surface, which has all these loops inserted between the core. And then this is the inside of the capsid. So just to um, tell the people in the audience who are thinking about packaging, this, there's a limited size inside, which is flanked by these strands, and therefore there's only so much that we can package in there, so, um, so that's just a warning. Um, and then we have this thing called the DE loop, which uh, surrounds the 5 channel, and then this HI loop, which I will come back to 
uh, during the talk. So then this very, very, very simple um, um, monomer fills this, um, this beautiful capsid. So the capsid I just want to introduce to you has a depression of the twofold. So I should back up and say this is a radially colored surface. So the red are the most furthest away from the center of the capsid and the blue are the closest to the center of the capsid. So hopefully in 2D you can see a 3D view. Um, so then we have, so as I said, we have this depression here. But then at the threefold, we have actually, it looks like a depression, but it's not. And it's surrounded by these three separate protrusions. And we have a channel at the fivefold. This is where that enzyme is supposed to come out to be able to modify the membrane to be able to escape during traffic in. And then we have this, what we call a two fivefold wall, and finally, um, these protrusions. So what we have is this capsid, very simple, has to perform all those steps that I showed you in the life cycle. So we have solved all the structures. Michael Chapman's group solved AV2 and 3B, and he also solved the AV6 in addition to us. So we've solved all the structures that we set out to do, which look very similar to what I just introduced to you. And we've also gone ahead and now started solving those RH structures, as I said. Uh, tomorrow you can hear about RH10 and, um, in, in the last AAV vector session. What we can tell you is that if you compare all these structures, is that they all look very, very similar, mostly, right? So you have the core, which is um, almost absolutely conserved. But then you have the surfaces, which are not so conserved. So if you pay attention, you see that these loops in different colors don't line up. And again, just for some of you out there, these are our AAV serotype colors. So if you ever see a picture and you see one of these colors, you know which AAV we're talking about. So everybody in my lab thinks I know exactly what each AAV looks like, but it's only because I know the colors. So <laughs> anyway, so this is where um, if you take those, so if I go back, if you take all these variable regions and you assemble the capsid with using those 60 monomers, this is what you see. They're actually all cluster on those raised regions of the capsid, as well as around the twofold, uh, uh, sorry, the fivefold core. So, um, so we have these common variable regions is what we call them. And then we hypothesize that the common variable regions allow phenotypic differences for what's needed, such as receptor binding, transduction, antibody recognition. But then if you think about trafficking, packaging assembly, which has to happen for the virus to survive, they have to be conserved. So this was our hypothesis going forward for functional annotation. So the first thing is attachment. So this is a slide borrowed from Arvin Asukan from UNC. And I love this slide because what he did is he put all the different AAVs on the outside and then you put in the different receptors that they have to recognize. So first of all, internalization receptors that have been identified. And then on the inner wheel, you put in the glycan receptors that are also essential for entry. And all of these lead to determinants of tropism. So then, um, so then I'm now going to summarize many, many years of work for you. So what we find of the virus is that most of those receptor binding regions happen in around those protrusions on the surface, which as I showed you, are very varied. So if I take a close-up look, you see it here. So you can see where AV5 binds this silic acid, AV4, AV2 binds this heparin, AV6 and 13 bind their heparin, and you will hear about RH10, and where it binds is glycan. AV1 binds silic acid, AV9 binds to galactose. So we can very nicely map onto the capsid where these dis different functions happen. So then what happens about trafficking? So this is like one of being our most exciting work to me. So in collaboration with Nick Musiska, we showed that the virus actually starts cleaving itself as pH drops. Um, so during trafficking, so this is just showing a gel with uh, increasing pH. You can see the increasing bands that are happening with A1 that recognizes the VP1U and the B1 that recognizes the end terminus. But what's really strange is that the virus starts stabilizing itself 
as it's cleaving itself. So it has to cleave itself to be able to traffic, but it stabilizes itself as well with the highest um, pH, well, the highest stability of pH 5.5, which is where one of the places where we think that VP1 has to come out. So then the question was, so is the capsid still intact? And the, the answer was yes, the virus is all still intact, even though they're cleaving themselves. So this was cool, and we see this for all the AAVs that we've looked at. So then we asked, so what do the structures look like? So this is AAV2, and I just want to draw your attention to this region here, which is close to our two-fold axis. So you see a big confirmation of changes happening here. So you go from this confirmation to this confirmation as the pH changes, which is very cool, very surprising, but cool. So then we ask, so what do we know about this region? So this is uh, that two five-fold wall, and what we know is that this is the dead zone that was described over 10 years ago by Locri and Peter Colosi. So that was very exciting for us. And this is also the A20 binding site um, that's been shown to be very important for the AAV. And, um, and then we showed as well that if you mutate some of those residues in that loop, you, you kill transduction. This is work in collaboration with Nick Musiska. And Nick also showed very nicely that if you change residues in this loop, transcription is impaired. So now you have the capsid playing a role post-nuclear entry, um, and it's all being controlled by this region. And I didn't see the poster, but I did get told that it's been shown that this variable region 9 is important for AV3B transduction of human um, cells uh, from the Wilson lab. So that's all very exciting. And so then we also showed with, um, in collaboration with uh, Rulis River Starver, that again, if you change residues within this region, um, from a, a tyrosine to a phi, you increase transduction. So these are the famous YF mutants that are being used. So we know that this region of the capsid is very important for the life cycle of the virus. So what about antibodies? So we know that antibodies are prevalent. This is just work from Shans in collaboration with Barry Byrne, Thomas, and Kristen, where we showed just from the people visiting Shans that there's a high prevalence of anti-AAV antibodies. So what is being done now is either you're excluded for a clinical trial or just transient immunosuppression. We decided that we were going to uh, modify the capsid by generating antibody escape vectors. So here's what we did. These are mouse monoclonals, but we took a polyclonal um, attitude where we said we're going to solve multiple structures for different capsids. Because these are all against AV1, this is AV3, AV8, and AV9 as an example. You, oops. So to be able to map these epitopes, we get structures. We are able to build um, capsid uh, models, antibody models, and we can see exactly where the antibodies are binding. So then we have what we call the roadmap, where you see the precise residues on the surface, where the antibody contact, and you know, that's um, shown here. So then we compared all the different epitopes, and this is what we see. We see that most of them lie either at this two five-fold wall right here, or the threefold region right here, or the fivefold region um, right there. So there's certain regions on the capsid that are the most dominant for antibody binding. So what we've been able to do is this. We've annotated the capsid. We think we know a lot about it and what the functions are. And then we could use this to guide us in modifying it for enhanced performance. So I'm just going to give you one example of AAV1 antibody escape variants. And so going back here, you heard from Antoinette Bennett about AAV1 in her poster on Wednesday. You will hear from Kenan tomorrow about the AAV9. So I'm just going to tell you about AAV1. So for the AAV1, we've been able to do all of this, and this is what we have. If you put the polyclonal response onto the capsid, you, oof, now I know why there was issues earlier. All right, you see that most of the capsid is covered by antibodies. 
So this is what we have to deal with. Um, and these are the epitopes for the different, um, at least the contact regions for the different antibodies. So what we did is ask, so where does silic acid bind relative to all of these? And that's shown here in purple. And so what we did is we figured out the residues involved in, in silic acid binding. And what we saw is that for this particular antibody, the virus, the, the residues that bind to the antibodies escape from, um, the, so the, the viruses, the, uh, these mutations are able to escape from antibody binding um, because when you change them. So we know that neutralization is blocking this receptor binding site. So we can use this information to help us move on. So then we took, uh, for our site-directed mutagenesis approach, we used two approaches, either site-directed mutagenesis or directed evolution. We just mutate individual amino acids in these variable loops to make a mutant. And then we ask the question, did we knock out the binding? And so what we have here is the wild-type virus alone. So these are all wild-type AV1, 2, which should not be recognized by these different antibodies. And then we have our mutant here. Okay, so the first, what you should see here, is in the presence of these antibodies, the virus is neutralized. In the, in, for AAV2, which should not be recognized by the antibodies, the virus is not neutralized. So now for the escape, we've been able to escape mostly, although he, this one is a little bit, uh, transduction is reduced. So then we were able to take this make this mutant, which is now able to um, escape from the parent antibody and move on to our next studies. The thing that we ask first is, okay, so what does this mean if we try and test it against patient sera? So in collaboration with Barry again, we took, he gave us some of the samples, at least some of the serum samples from his children from his clinical trial. So this is just a different patients. These patients here were immunosuppressed, these were not. So what we did was we took the sera and we tested it against our, our, um, our vector. So this is just showing just a native dot block with uh, this is a, an antibody that is in a region that we did not mutate. So you can see it recognizes the wild type and the mutant. But when you look at the, the, for the wild type and the mutant, you see that the recognition is definitely reduced for the mutant relative to the wild type. And then, um, so this is just different examples. This is another patient, this is another patient. What is interesting is that the different, the patient reactivities against the mutant are different, which is exactly what you would expect. And also what is, you see is that yes, we haven't completely knocked it out because if I go back real quick, we haven't actually mutated this epitope here. The reason for that is that that epitope actually overlaps is that twofold region that I showed you is very important for transduction. So we have to be very careful when we're messing with it and we haven't started doing that yet. So what about um, um, gene expression? So this is just showing you a comparison of the mutant in red and the wild type in blue and different dilutions of the patient sera. And what we see is that the mutant is able to better escape from the patient sera. Again, it's not complete because we have not knocked out all the different epitopes here yet. So we see similar observations for the other two patient sera we've tested. And then now we think this mutant is you know, one of the candidates that we could use, possibly improve a little bit more, but uh, we believe it's ready um, for, to try gene delivery. So then the other approach that we use, which I'm not going to talk about because Again, it'll be talked about this afternoon by Victor from Arvin's lab, is directed evolution. In this case, we take each epitope and we, you know, randomize, we make all the different positions of the different amino acids. We change those, make libraries, and then individually, and then we combine them, and then we come up with a lead candidate. And in that case, we've been able to come up with this mutant called CAM130, where all three epitopes are mutated, tested it against pooled human sera, and you can see that the transduction is much higher in the presence of IVIG, or in this case, in the presence of individual human sera. 
So we can modify these um, positions based on what we know um, because of the mouse monoclonals, and we can, um, we can still get good transduction, escape from human serum. So these are, you know, this is, this is for us, is very exciting. And this was for a dilution of one in five in this case. So, um, and, this, and, and this article, um, this study is now in press. So we are able to know that for most of the AAVs, they use common receptor attachment sites, despite the fact that they may have different tropisms, different transduction efficiencies. They have overlapping receptor and antigenic sites. We can't just randomly mutate the antigenic sites. We have to think about um, what, what needs to be done for the virus to infect. We could think about trafficking. Most of the trafficking properties are conserved. Again, we have to, when we're modifying the capsid, we have to be aware of what we can and cannot modify. We could obviously use mutagenesis to confirm all this different information. We have to check first that we can uh, escape parental antibody neutralization and then go on to patient sera. Um, um, in the two examples that I showed you, and we obviously have other examples. So then, two years ago, AAV celebrated his 50th birthday, which was really um, wonderful for us. And then, so then, but what I would like to close with is this, is that for the challenges that I mentioned, obviously there are different people using different um, uh, strategies. Our strategy is obviously to look at the capsid, and modify it. Uh, in collaboration with Drew Samolsky, we modified AV2 to have some functions of AV1 to make AV2.5, which went into the clinic. Uh, with Arvin, we've modified a vector that has both heparin binding and galactose binding properties called 2G9, which we hope will go into the clinic. For transduction, we worked with Arun to make the tyrosine mutants, which are being used for uh, gene, uh, clinical trials by AGTC. Um, this is, again, just the AV2.5, where the therapeutic gene was reduced in size, it was miniaturized. And we're modifying the capsid, and I didn't have a, really a time to talk to you about that, to try and improve this packaging. As I said to you, the volume inside is not going to change. So you have to change the capsid to maybe help you condense um, the DNA. And then here, with the antibody vector, um, escaping vectors against the 2.5, that was one of the things that we were aiming for. And of course, our goal is to be able to put some of our newer vectors into the clinic. So I think it's been pretty um, rewarding and has helped in enhancing performance for a lot of these AAVs. So that leaves me um, to just acknowledge, um, and this collaboration list is actually not full. It's just a, a collaboration list for things that I talked to you about. Colin Parrish got us started in working with antibodies. Jay Carini has been working with us with receptors and antibodies for a long time. Tim Baker helps us with cryo-EM. University of Florida, there's a whole list of people. Barry, Nick, Arun, Sergey. Sergey worked with us to make all our AAVs in the first place. At UNC, we have Jude and Arvin. And at the German Cancer Center, we have um, Jurgen. In my lab, we have many past members, including Yushan, who's here. Um, Brittany Gerda started um, this, um, this work. And then Nikia, Kenan, Antoinette, and Mario are the people who are really working on the antibody stuff. These are all my undergraduates who work on it, uh, my technicians who work on it, and I thank NIH for its support. Thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions. The floor is open for questions. I have a question about the uh, pH work that you showed. Mm -hmm. So the, the two-fold axis is, doesn't have very many contacts that holds it together. So um, can you comment on whether you think that that could be helping with uncoding? I, th I think it could. I mean, it is the, so it's the weakest. Um, so um, th the reason the, the question is asked is because the two-fold region actually has the least interactions between monomers. And so, yes, I think it could. I, so we always think the fivefold is where on coating happens or VP1U comes out. 
So what we're seeing is that the VP, uh, the twofold is opening up as pH drops. So whether or not it's really on coding or whether or not it's related to VP1U externalization, I think it's related to the dynamics post-entry. Yeah. So beautiful talk, Mavis. Um, Thank you. Just wondering about all those people who have AAV antibodies. So do you, have you ever caught somebody seroconverting, or has anybody looked to see whether they all are also um, positive for anti-adeno um, antibodies? Right. But, you know, how do they actually get it, and how does it spread, and how do they seroconvert? Well, I don't know if anybody's looked for anti-ad, but probably they, they probably will have it. Um, but I don't, and I don't know if anybody's caught anybody seroconverted. Um, we just, well, all we've done is screened, you know, after the fact. So if we screen everybody in this room, we know that 70% of us are going to have anti-AAV antibodies, you know. Um, but how we got it, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> So thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you had the chance to test or uh, if you can speculate about, uh, do you think that this modification can impact also on T cell recognition of different uh, AAV capsid or? Well, from, from what I know, so I've talked to Frederico a lot about T cell and, and I normally run away when he talks about it because I can't do anything about it. Um, because a lot of the recognition is to conserved regions. Right, so the conserved core regions, um, we, you know, we can't modify at all. Uh, but but there, it's possible that the modifications on surface loops can, you know, can impact, can reduce, because I know there are people who have identified surface regions that differ between, say, AV2 and 8, and they say plays a role in, in, you know, in T cell um, recognition. So possibly, but... My, my, uh, my feeling is mostly is the core conserved regions that are playing the most role there. Thank so. you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have one question. Yes. So you made mutation. Do you see any mutation that will impact the virus assembly? Oh, yeah. So have you, <laughs> uh, because, you know, some... Some people, they, you know, when they mutate, it, it gets, uh, you know, no packaging at yeah. all. So. Yeah, we have. I mean, it only takes a single amino acid. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the famous one is there's a residue buried inside a capsid. It's residue 432. Um, the Nick Mazisca's group discovered it going from an arginine to an alanine um, totally stops packaging. And we, we've got those structures, and we, we show that the capsid is destabilized, uh, and that's why it's not able to package. And we've identified other single residues during our work that, yeah, this completely stops packaging. So, yeah, you have to be careful about that, too. Questions? All right, let's thank right. Dr. McKenna. Well, thank you. And up next, we have Grant McFadden, and he's going to be sharing with us uh, his amazing work on the next steps for oncolytic viral therapies. I need the clicker. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I, I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation to speak and also for their title. Um, <laughs> so um, it, it's actually a, a very opportune time to talk about this subject. Um, those of you that were here yesterday morning for the oncolytic virus session got an outstanding primer as to where oncolytic virotherapy is nowadays. Uh, and it's really quite amazing the progress that, that has been made over the past few years and decade. So um, what I'm going to talk about are a couple of challenges for the future and try and just give you some of my thoughts ab about uh, how they can be addressed. First of all, my disclosure, uh, my partner, Going into clinical trials is a company called DNAtrix, and, and, and uh, they will be the ones uh, who will be assisting me in going forward to the clinical trials that I'll be uh, briefly describing at the preclinical level. So, um, the, the paradigm of oncolytic virotherapy uh, has kind of uh, uh, changed a little bit over the past uh, five, six years. Uh, previously, in the early days, it was thought that 
a successful oncolytic virus had to get in, find every single cancer cell, infect it, and kill it. And then cancer was gone. And uh, um, since then, uh, clinical trials and, and a large body of preclinical data indicates that this is, in fact, an oversimplification, uh, that, in fact, uh, successful clinical trials, that is to say what we call elite responders in the clinic, uh, those are patients that receive viral therapy, uh, an immune system is generated against the virus and also to tumor antigens, and uh, the tumor regression continues after the virus has been cleared. And so consequently, we're now uh, in a situation where most people believe successful oncolytic viral therapy requires two steps. The first step being the oncolytic, uh, which is uh, subject to getting the virus to tumor beds, uh, and including possibly metastatic sites that are hard to get to. And uh, following replication and killing of cells in the tumor beds, uh, and engagement of the acquired immune system results in more prolonged anti-tumor immunity as kind of the second phase after the virus uh, has finished uh, doing its work. So um, a number of challenges have arisen uh, to try and make this more uniform. Uh, one, one of the uh, observations in the clinic uh, is that uh, some patients respond very well to the therapy and some patients don't. And uh, there's a great deal of interest in trying to figure out what's different, what, what is so different about between those populations, between the responders and the non-responders. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two challenges, one being virus delivery uh, and the other being uh, uh, how exactly should a virus-infected uh, cell uh, best promote uh, anti-tumor uh, immune responses. So uh, there's several dozen viruses out there that we call oncolytic viruses. Uh, they, they, they share the common property that they show a greater proclivity to replicate and kill cancer cells compared to surrounding uh, normal somatic cells and tissues. Um, they come in all sizes and shapes. The genetic diversity between these viruses is enormous. Uh, even within categories, uh, uh, the viruses can be biologically very, very different from each other. So sometimes it's hard to come up with general grand principles when you get to the nitty-gritty, to the details of individual oncolytic viruses. So uh, I'm going to be talking about oncolytic pox viruses. Uh, there are two of them uh, that are in uh, various stages of development. One is vaccinia virus and the other is myxoma virus. And my lab has been studying myxoma virus for many years now. And uh, the, the lessons that I have learned about oncolytic viral therapy, I've learned from it. And I'm going to tell you a, a few of them today. So I got interested in oncolytic viral therapy almost by accident. Uh, the virus that we study uh, is a pathogen of rabbits. Uh, and it's utterly restricted to lagomorphs in nature. And left to its own devices, it can't get outside of lagomorphs. It's got two hosts. One is uh, the long-term evolutionary host, and the other is the pathologic host, where it causes an extreme disease called myxomatosis. And, uh, but the main thing is that this virus is very safe to work with. It can't infect mice, humans, or any other species outside the rabbit. Uh, and uh, it has been a, a really excellent model to try and understand how viruses interact with the immune system. But a number of years ago, uh, we kind of stumbled upon uh, the observation that uh, uh, the virus will infect cells outside the rabbit under certain <coughs> circumstances. And uh, the, the circumstance most relevant today uh, is transformed uh, either human or mouse cells. Um, normally what happens when the virus tries to infect a normal human cell or a normal mouse cell, it triggers antiviral immune responses that, that basically defeat the virus. So it's one of the reasons, in fact, it's probably the prime reason the virus cannot escape lagomorphs in nature. It's because it's incapable of defeating the various antiviral pathways of normal somatic cells of humans or mice or anything outside a rabbit. But when these cells are transformed, one of the things that happens uh, is that they progressively lose their capacity to engage in antiviral signaling pathways and they become more sensitive to replication to a number of viruses, not only this one, but it's kind of the, the essential Achilles heel of cancer 
that uh, inevitably the process of transformation and eventually metastasis makes the cells more susceptible to infection by certain intracellular pathogens, sometimes a lot of them, sometimes a small number. And even today, we can't really predict just based on sequence which cancer cells are going to be susceptible to which viruses. Uh, pretty much, we still have to learn that empirically. So uh, there are a number of different projects and collaborators that we have in the area of oncolytic viral therapy. They kind of divide themselves into two pots. Uh, the first pot is what we call in situ viral, ther viral therapy. And this is kind of classic viral therapy in the sense that cancer is in the recipient of some fashion. And uh, the idea is to deliver virus to as many of the tumor sites as possible and then try and clear the cancer from its, its location in situ. And this is what most people think of when they think of a, a sort of classic viral therapy. We also have projects that we call ex vivo viral therapy uh, in which uh, um, we're utilizing in the context of bone marrow transplants. And I'll explain in a few minutes how we got into the business of, of exploiting uh, the addition of viral therapy to bone marrow transplants. But I'm going to take an example from two, uh, uh, one of uh, each of these sets of projects to illustrate the one of those two challenges. So I'm going to use this uh, model to illustrate the delivery issue, and I'm going to use um, the glioblastoma model that uh, we engage with my collaborator, Peter Forsyth, uh, to look at uh, the, 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 the optimization of uh, death inside of a tumor bed in order to uh, facilitate immune clearance uh, of uh, the tumor. So um, this was actually uh, my very first collaboration, uh, my entrance into oncolytic viral therapy. Peter Forsyth uh, was at the time at the University of Calgary in Canada and has since moved. He's now the head of neuro-oncology the, the, um, in Tampa uh, at the Moffitt Cancer Center. So uh, in this initial study, uh, this was around the time that we discovered the virus replicates very well in human tumor cells, but is uh, harmless for humans and, and for uh, mice. So uh, we entered into this collaboration and Peter set up a, a glioblastoma model in which immunodeficient mice had engrafted into their brains a human glioblastoma cell line called U87. And what happens is, is that uh, a glioblastoma grows out and kills the mice within about a month after the implantation. So during that month, that's a, time, a therapeutic window or a window of time that allows you to test therapeutics. And Peter's lab spent, has spent years looking at different therapeutics to try and cure those mice of their human glioblastomas, including oncolytic viruses. So he heard about our work and he said, why don't you give me some of your uh, magic virus that expresses EGFP and we'll track it. And, and what we observed, and this is a number of years ago, is that when he stereotactically injected myxoma expressing EGFP into the tumor bed, the virus grew out as if it was in rabbit tissue, uh, spread through the tumor tissue, and then the tumor tissue began to regress. And when the, the tumors were all regressed, the virus vanished because it no longer had cells to grow in. So we were able to convert a kill curve like this to a survival curve like that, and at SAC point, uh, the mice were essentially clear of the, their glioblastomas. So this was a good result, and, and Peter was happy, and I was kind of amazed. And um, so uh, we then began to look for more and more stringent models of, of cancer. And uh, more recently, uh, we've gone into uh, what's called uh, uh, BTIC, brain tumor initiating cells, uh, either from mouse or humans, uh, uh, implanted into the brains of, of recipient mice. And uh, BTICs, and you, kind of, you can think of them as like cancer stem cells, uh, generate cancers that are much more diverse, much more metastatic, uh, and you can do it in immunocompetent host. And so one of, one of the things we all know is that tumor beds are really very complicated mixtures of tumor cells, support cells. Some of the support cells uh, are just physical support, but some are immunological support. And so the, the, the complex brew of effector molecules that are in real tumor tissues is much more diverse and, uh, that, than the previous model that, that I, I showed to you. So uh, when we started pilot experiments, we found that the wild-type virus could not cure these particular glioblastomas, so murine BTIC-driven glioblastomas in immunocompetent mice. So we decided uh, this is, can be a, a testing ground for us to learn new modalities 
And so we went looking for ideas of, of what could we do to make the virus more immunogenic and, and more prone to the oncolytic result that we wanted, given the fact that we knew what, 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 what it would look like uh, if it was successful. So uh, to make a long story short, we went into our library of knockout mutants in the virus. So over the years, we've uh, knocked out various genes in the virus for the purpose of, uh, of understanding better the interaction of the virus with the host immune system. And uh, each of these knockouts has taught us an enormous amount. But uh, we decided to focus on a couple of them, and, and the one I'll tell you about today is this guy here, uh, M11L. So M11L, we had studied in the lab a number of years ago, and we had uh, discovered it as an inhibitor of apoptosis. And when we looked at the protein itself, it's a viral protein that goes to the outer mitochondrial membrane and interacts with molecules, including back and backs, to prevent apoptotic signals that, that percolate through the mitochondria. So uh, uh, with collaborations, we ended up uh, um, doing the crystal structure of it. It turns out to be a very close homolog uh, structurally of BCL2. It's a member of the BCL2 inhibitor families, uh, members, uh, although its sequence uh, is not at all like BCL2. So this is a case of uh, not sequence uh, conservation or, or convergence, but actual folding convergence. But the main thing is that this is a, a virus encoded gene product that goes to the mitochondria and prevents uh, um, apoptotic signals from percolating through the mitochondria. What that means is that the knockout virus is more prone to inducing apoptosis in a broad variety of cells. So we thought since it induces apoptosis more, perhaps it would be a better oncolytic platform for this very difficult glioblastoma model. So uh, to make a, a long story short, uh, uh, most of this was recently published. Um, the M11L minus virus turned out to be a better killer of BTICs, uh, brain tumor initiating cells, either from mice or from humans. Uh, here you can just simply see the, the kill curve in vitro. The red shows you the, the, the improved cap capability of the M11L minus virus to kill uh, these BTICs in culture. And on the far left here, you see example. This is the liberation of cytochrome C, which is one of the, the hallmarks of what happens when, when the mitochondria signal an apoptotic pathway. And what you can see is that control cells or cells infected with the wild-type virus, there's no liberation of cytochrome C. But the M11L minus virus, there's, there's copious release of, of cytochrome C comparable to uh, a cytotoxic agent uh, like, uh, like, uh, um, like in this particular case, um, uh, the, um, the small molecule inhibitor that's a proapitotic inducer. So this was good. So then we went on to the animal models and started to see wh what is the relative capacity of, of these two viruses to, uh, uh, first of all, to induce apoptosis in the growing glioblastoma bed uh, in the immunocompetent host. And what we found, uh, here is our first surprise, is that the M11L uh, minus virus by itself uh, could not uh, induce uh, um, um, the obvious appearance of apoptosis as measured by activated caspase 3 in tissues. However, in combination with temozolomide, which is a standard uh, uh, chemotherapeutic now currently used uh, uh, for uh, um, glioblastoma, in the combination of the two, but neither one alone, we could now see uh, uh, activated caspase 3 in the, uh, uh, the tumor beds. So that was very interesting and shows, in fact, it's a reminder that cells in culture and cells buried in to, uh, complicated tumor tissues can, can have very different behaviors. But the, but the revealing result was the in vivo animal uh, results, which are shown here. So uh, what we found is we could not cure those mice of the BTIC-induced glioblastomas with either the wild type or the knockout virus by itself, although the knockout virus provided some uh, increase in life in survival, but, but not, not particularly dramatic. However, uh, when we combined temozolomide uh, with the M11L minus virus, but no other combination, now we started to see long-term survivors the way we saw uh, with the original U87 model. And a, a particular interest is that the same protocol done in immunodeficient mice did not give any long-term survivors, which is kind of a reminder that it's not only the virus replication in the tumor bed, but, but it's, the, it's the assistance of the acquired immune system that is required for the long-term regression of these cancers. 
So this kind of reinforces uh, one of the lessons and, and sort of w one of the ideas going forward in alkalinic viral therapy in that the kind of cell death matters. Um, it, we call it immunogenic cell death, often without quite understanding what it really is and really means in, in a tumor bed. Uh, but it clearly matters, uh, and in this case, uh, it took the uh, one particular knockout in conjunction with a chemotherapeutic in order to generate the right immunogenic cell death. And this is one area where uh, um, uh, future studies and, and, and future investigations clearly need to go. How do we improve, how do we generate immunogenic cell death of the kind that generates immune responses to tumor antigens? And there's a lot more to be learned in this area, and I suspect you're going to hear a lot about it uh, from the field. So that was uh, uh, the first uh, sort of uh, a mini lesson. The second one has to do with uh, virus delivery. And uh, I got into this uh, a little bit by accident, uh, pursuing a different question. So what I'm going to do today is compare uh, systemic delivery of virus. So those of you that were at Steve Russell's uh, talk yesterday, he emphasized absolutely uh, uh, correctly that one of the, the key challenges is how do you deliver the virus to uh, particularly disseminated disease that includes metastatic sites, hard to reach sites, things where intratumoral injection clearly is, is insufficient for, uh, for the problem. So generally, uh, uh, m there are more clinical trials devoted to systemic delivery of virus by taking the free virion and putting it into the circulation. And uh, certainly it, it, it is, uh, I would say, the, the, the most common method of systemic delivery of oncolytic viruses right now. I'm gonna compare that to its, its counterpart which is ex vivo viral therapy, in other words, adding the virus to external carrier cells and uh, uh, then injecting or infusing the virus infected cells back into the patient. So in this case, the virus will circulate according to its particulate nature. In this case, the virus hitchhikes on the cells and goes where the cells tend to take it. And people that do these kinds of experiments, so looking at carrier cells, traditionally have picked specific cells and done the experiment uh, by, let's say, looking at mesenchymal stem cells or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or whatever, and asking them to deliver the virus to the sites of residual disease or, or metastatic uh, disease. I'm gonna talk about how cells in a bone marrow transplant can be co-opted to do this. And how we got into this uh, was uh, we were investigating a slightly different question. So many of you know that uh, there are two kinds of transplants, uh, of immune rescue transplants. Autologous, where the donor is the, the patient, or this is a self-transplant, and the other is allogeneic, where the donor is an MHC-matched uh, non-self. Uh, uh, the, the closer the MHC match, the better. The advantages of self-transplants is that they're safe. They tend to engraft the immune system very well. Uh, the downside is that there's very little uh, capacity of the graft to go after residual cancer, what we call graft versus cancer. And so, as a result, uh, uh, most cancer patients after autotransplants uh, suffer from recurrence of residual cancer that the, the chemotherapy wasn't able to ablate completely. Um, the advantage of uh, allogeneic transplants, uh, so an another disadvantage is sometimes the transplants themselves can have cancer cells in them. And we got into this business just simply to ask a, a simple question. Could we use an oncolytic virus to delete cancer cells but leave the normal human CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells alone? And the bottom line, I'm not gonna talk about that today, is that it does that job very well. It deletes uh, myeloma cells or AML cells very well, but it doesn't bind or infect the uh, CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. The, disadvantage, the advantage of allogeneic transplant is that the transplants never have cancer in them, uh, and they've got, at the same time, they've got T cells that are mismatched to, to both the patient and the cancer, and so there's the capacity of T cells in the allogeneic transplant to uh, uh, mediate uh, effective graft-versus-cancer. Uh, and this, in fact, does happen, and uh, uh, there, there's more likelihood for a, uh, a, a, a uh, complete clearance of residual cancer after an allogeneic transplant. But the downside is that T cells also cause a disease known as graft-versus-host disease that can be uh, a very serious, in, in, including lethal to, uh, to the recipient. So when we got into this, we were just simply asking, could an oncolytic virus, in this case a myxoma virus, 
uh, delete cancer cells and uh, um, not hurt the stem cells, and it did that very well. But as we were doing these experiments, we uh, came to realize that in fact the virus did try to infect other cells of the transplant, and those cells became carrier cells for the virus that could deliver the virus to sites of residual disease in the recipient. So uh, we, uh, Nancy Villa in, in our group, uh, spent some time trying to understand what does myxoma virus do to human T cells, and she recently published a paper, and I won't show any of the data, other than to simply point out, it kind of sets the stage for the experiments I'll be talking about today. Uh, what she was able to show is that myxoma virus is able to bind human naive T cells, and when those T cells get activated, it launches the virus replication cycle, and the cells become carriers. That is to say, they become uh, capable of transmitting the virus, ferrying it from site A to site B, depending to where the, the, the cells happen to go, and then by cell-to-cell -cell contact, deliver the virus and kill the recipient target cells. So uh, we then wanted to test all of these things in uh, an animal model, an immunocompetent animal model of disseminated disease. And so we ended up picking this uh, uh, model, murine model of multiple myeloma, uh, in which uh, murine multiple myeloma cells are tagged either with DS-RED or, or with luciferase, <laughs> And the cells are very nice. You can put them into BALB-C mice, immunocompetent, and shortly after the engraftment, it'll uh, engraft into the bone marrow, into the spleen, and a couple other uh, uh, sites. And uh, you can get DS red tag myeloma within about a month after, after the infusion. So during this time, during this engraftment time, we could then ask questions like, could a transplant uh, uh, cure those mice when the disease burden is low? And if we added virus to that transplant, would it change the outcome? So the model is kind of like this. So you take an immunocompetent mouse, you uh, uh, infuse the DS red tag myeloma cells, and then after one week at a time when the disease burden is very low, but it's disseminated all through the animal through many different sites, those animals are given a bone marrow transplant, and we can give either an allo transplant, a C57, or an auto transplant, a BELB-C. And then we can either add virus or not, and then we can examine the outcome after six weeks by simply quantifying the amount of DS red uh, tagged myeloma in the bone marrow or in the spleen or anywhere else. So uh, we recently published the results of the allo transplant, and, and this is just some data uh, from that. Uh, what you see in blue here, these are control mice that didn't receive a transplant, and so they start dying of the myeloma. And uh, at this point, at the SAC point, the, their bone marrow and their spleen is actually full of DS red myeloma. Um, if we give them an allo transplant, you can see the result is worse. And that's because not only do these mice have myeloma, but they're suffering from GBHD because it's an allo transplant. So uh, the outcome of just the allo transplant alone is obviously worse uh, than just leaving the disease alone. However, if we took that uh, allo transplant and simply added virus one hour before the transplant just to allow absorption, went ahead with it, the results were much better and uh, they were really quite dramatic when we looked at disease burden in various places and this is disease burden in the, uh, uh, in the, um, the bone marrow. So, uh, but perhaps uh, the most dramatic data has to do with uh, what we call disease-free animals. These are animals at which at SAC point we could not find any uh, DS red tag myeloma by our criteria of facts or, or, or whatever. And uh, so it jumped dramatically when uh, the virus was added to the bone marrow, but not to the bone marrow transplant alone. So when we got this, these results, uh, and um, we next wanted to know what about auto transplants, uh, because in some diseases like multiple myeloma, the, uh, uh, the transplant is generally auto, it's not allo. So one of the things we noticed uh, in this particular study that quite surprised us is our assumption at the time is that it was the T cells doing all of the killing. That is to say, the t it was the T cells in the transplant that were receiving the virus, converted to carriers, went to uh, distant metastatic sites, and deleted uh, the, 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 the uh, DS red tag myeloma. But uh, when we actually went to show that by depleting T cells from the transplant, and this is an ex vivo reconstitution, what we observed is in fact that there's another cell type uh, hiding in the bone marrow that we had never paid any attention to that was capable of taking up the virus and then becoming excellent killer, killers of myeloma cells, and that was the neutrophils. 
And uh, so we were able to see very good killing of the myeloma cells in a virus-dependent fashion uh, with purified neutrophils. And when we deleted neutrophils from the bone marrow, in fact, it wasn't very good at killing at all. So uh, this then has got us to thinking that maybe there are multiple cell classes in classic bone marrow transplants that can do work for us. And uh, it turns out there's an extensive literature of neutrophils trying to kill cancer and mostly failing. But in terms of their capacity to traffic, they're very good at trafficking to primary and metastatic sites. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we began to wonder uh, if that's the case, then maybe autotransplants that of course have neutrophils every bit as much as allotransplants, maybe they would also be capable of uh, um, uh, causing this virus specific uh, clearance of residual cancer. So I'll show you some uh, very recent data on the autologous uh, bone marrow transplants. And now I, we're comparing free virus to virus that's been loaded onto uh, autotransplant samples. And uh, what we found is uh, the bone marrow transplant by itself was really ineffective at doing anything for either survival or, or residual disease. And that that's really mimics what is seen in the clinical setting as well. Um, the, uh, the bone marrow plus virus was now very good. It was actually just every bit as good as it was in the aloe transplant. But a little bit surprising to me was how good the virus alone was. Uh, it was actually causing you know, significant debulking, uh, or at this point was causing a significant increase in uh, survival. Uh, and in fact, when we looked at disease burden in either the spleen or the bone marrow, the virus alone wasn't bad at all at debulking uh, the amount of disease. But the best result was with the bone marrow plus the virus. And this was highlighted when we looked at disease-free survival. And what we found is that uh, even though the virus alone was very good at debulking, it didn't really change the amount of disease-free survival. So it was not the most efficient way of getting to every single site of residual disease. But the bone marrow with the virus was now every bit as, as uh, successful, every bit as, uh, has the capacity of going after residual disease as the aloe transplant. So uh, that's uh, kind of where we are right now. Uh, the bottom line uh, is that in the context of a bone marrow transplant, there are multiple cell types in a transplant that can do work for us. That is to say, can take up virus, can uh, deliver virus to sites of residual disease, uh, and can uh, uh, and, uh, function in that sense as carrier cells. Uh, at this point uh, where we are, it's possible there are other cells uh, in addition to that. The main reason we can do these experiments is because of the bi the, this particular virus cannot bind, infect, or touch the hematopoietic stem cells that are needed for the immune engraftment. But they certainly do uh, uh, interact with cells of other lineages, and some of these have turned out to be very useful indeed. So here are the lessons, uh, the, the mini lessons uh, for uh, uh, what I've told you today. Uh, we all are in agreement that oncolytic viruses have to engage anti-tumor immunity. And uh, so, uh, and this is probably the basis for why oncolytic viruses are, are so nice, appear to be so far, so nicely synergistic with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors don't create T cells recognizing uh, new uh, antigen targets. But oncolytic viral therapy and, 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 and induced death in the cancer bed can. And so it clearly show, shows, the, points the way to future synergies between uh, modalities like oncolytic viruses and other drugs and, and ICIs in particular. The, the, the next point is that the kind of cell death matters. And, and uh, uh, we all kind of believe this anyway. Uh, we all have this mantra that immunogenic cell death is important because it might allow epitopes, what we call epitope spreading, or the recognition of new antigens or neoantigens or, or, or cryptic tumor antigens or whatever by the, con by, by the way that the cells are killed. And one of the things we do know about viruses uh, is that virus-induced death is a little different than the death in a non-virus-infected uh, context. So what I'm saying is we talk about virus-induced apoptosis but virus-induced apoptosis is not identical to apoptosis induced, for example, by drugs or development or, or other kinds of, of uh, um, sort of inducers. There are different kinds of death. 
And, and one of the, the challenges in the future, and, and, and really uh, areas that we all need to know more about, is what is the right kind of death, and how do we preferentially induce it in the modalities we're looking at. In, in our case, we can use knockouts and knock-ins from the virus construct, but there are clearly other ways of doing it. But the bottom line is that uh, the, the kind of cell death does matter. And what we've kind of learned is that uh, oncolytic virus carriers can come in more sizes and shapes and forms than we had originally thought. You don't necessarily have to go in and purify the carrier to get it to do work for you. Because in our case, we're actually exploiting cells of a bone marrow transplant to actually do that job for us, to help deliver the virus to sites of metastatic disease. And so uh, what we are working on the lab right now is that uh, how, how are T cells armed and, and why are they better killers? How are neutrophils armed and why are they better killers? And in fact, uh, uh, are all of these cells the same or are there subclasses that do the job better? Do we have to do it in the context of a transplant or can we just uh, isolate the cells by themselves? We don't know the answers to, to those questions yet, but those are the sort of things that we're very interested in, in following up. So uh, here are the people in my uh, new lab at the uh, Biodesign Institute in, uh, er at Arizona State University. I've got a lot of collaborators, uh, and uh, I have to thank my, my partners uh, at uh, N NIH. Uh, when my lab was in Florida, it was funded by the Bankhead Coley Foundation, and, and this is my new corporate partner. And I want to thank the guys uh, who moved with me uh, from the University of Florida uh, to my new home and they're forming the, the central team of, of us going forwards. So thank you very much. Questions for Dr. McFadden. So uh, the, uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it's behaving like an immune adjuvant uh, or an immune stimulant or... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the so the, the question is, uh, I was asked, temozolomide is known to affect uh, Tregs. And uh, so the question uh, was, uh, what regimen uh, was used? And uh, uh, sort of the subtext is, is it being functioning as an immune adjuvant as opposed to simply a killer of, of cancer cells? So uh, what we found when we've done experiments like this is the regimen sometimes matters a lot. Uh, we did not explore different regimens of, of temozole. It was just simply done pretty much in a simultaneous fashion. But there are when we've looked at this question with other drugs and other situations, the regimen, the timing does matter. And uh, so I can't really say if the regimen had any real consequences for this particular because we, we didn't examine it. Uh, but in previous studies, when we've looked, for example, at gemcitabine uh, and virus, the order in the regimen did matter a lot, and that's something that we probably would have to go after and, and look at greater detail in the future, because it's clearly functioning in some immune capacity, and the actual regimen may matter a lot. Great talk, Grant. Um, do you think the virus is actually infecting the T cells and or the neutrophils? And are they releasing progeny, or are they just carrying? Right. So it depends upon, uh, I'll talk about T cells first. It depends on the context. So in a naive T cell, uh, a CD3, doesn't matter if it's CD4 or CD8, uh, the virus binds to it but does not initiate the replication cycle. However, when that T cell gets an activation signal, that kind of releases the block, and, and the virus then gets into its replication cycle and makes progeny. So in that particular case, the cells become carrier of progeny after activation. The neutrophils, we don't yet know a great deal. Uh, we know we can turn them green, but we don't yet know if they're making progeny. But they certainly are much better at killing the myeloma cells when they've got virus in them. So, uh, and what I can tell you though is that T cells, we looked at that question, does it take progeny to do the killing and transfer or could parental virus that sticks to the cells actually do it as well? And what we found is that both are capable of doing it. So virus stuck to a cell is capable of killing a, a myeloma 
and the progeny virus made from a T cell that's activated and making progeny is also capable of infecting and killing a myeloma. So both are possible, but with neutrophils, we don't know yet. It's still too early One other quick day. question. So when you stabilize the mitochondrial membrane with the M11L, how are the cells actually dying then? Uh, actually, when you look at them, they, they don't show the obvious signs of apoptotic cell death. Uh, in the long run, uh, if the cells are permissive, they make virus, and eventually they slow down and die. But it's not like a lytic event. It's not an obvious uh, apoptotic event, but it is death. Uh, but it's like a slow death. It might be a kind that we don't really appreciate that may also be important immunologically, but, but it's, it's not a classic apoptosis or necroptosis or any of those. So the obvious question for me is, have you tried the loaded T or or neutrophils in the immuno-incompetent mouse uh, to see if that's all you need. Yeah, so uh, we, we have done some experiments of human uh, myeloma in an NSG mouse, and what we found, uh, the way we did those experiments, that was before we were paying attention to the specifics, is that uh, the, 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 the transplant itself cleared the, the tumor and the virus didn't make it, didn't, we were already maxed out, it didn't really change it. So we haven't, we don't really have data on, do you have to have an immune system for that killing. Um, it, we, we just don't have the data yet. So a very nice talk actually, I forgot to say that the first time. But uh, I just wondered, the, you were surprised by the free virus eff efficacy yep. in the last model. Do you think, do you know if there's just picked up by the T cells and neutrophils once you inject them and transport it? The That's tumor? entirely possible. I, 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 Previously, I'd always thought that, that the majority of particulate virus either went to the liver or the spleen, or some of it would kind of like diffuse into sites. Now I'm beginning to think that in fact, after infusion, it may be taken up by circulating cells faster than we had thought, and then they become in effect carrier-like. Uh, so uh, the short answer is that may be a genuine possibility. So great talk. Uh, I'm a bit wondering, when you induce the apoptosis, sometimes apoptosis induces a tolerance to the such yep. a cell. So how can you explain you know, such you know, increasing the combination of the with chemotherapy increasing the symptoms of caspase expressing cells, then may induce apoptosis, but those mice showing the better survival. So do, did you identify which antigen recognize those immune cells? Well, such an antigen, oh. Right. So, so the question is actually quite important uh, in the sense that uh, what kind of death do you want? We call it apoptosis because we see cleave caspase 3, but chances are it's a mixture of different kinds of death depending on what kind of cell is infected. Most of us think that we want liberation of uh, tumor antigens of, of, uh, in some fashion uh, in a necrotic-like fashion so that it can be taken up by cross-presentation. So uh, the short answer is that if it was all just classic apoptosis, yes, it, 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 I, I agree. But almost for sure, when we look at it in greater detail, what we're going to find is that there are different kinds of death. The virus has altered the, the, the death program in different kinds of cells, but in different ways. So it's a little bit complicated, and so we kind of have to kind of rely upon the end result and back up and ask, what, are we, what have we done that has the best tumor regression and then try to understand it better. Wonderful talk. Um, I have one question, just uh, curiously. So do you think uh, if you can arm the virus with something else, like a toxic gene or like apoptox, apoptotic gene, maybe make them more powerful? Yeah, so a lot of us who do play these games, in fact, <laughs> do a lot of knock-ins. Uh, we've got a library of knock-ins of various transgenes, uh, some of which are more uh, uh, what we think to be more pro-immunogenic, uh, and uh, the, the, the short answer is yes, we do that all the time, and we tend to talk about it when it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, this, uh, if no more questions, this concludes our...